Good morning, world. Uh, it's a little crazy outside, but we are here today with Jim Nettles, who is going to tell us all sorts of interesting things about um, writing, because there's nothing else to do, and that is perfectly okay. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself and what's going on in your world, writing-related or otherwise. Um, well, I'm Jim Nettles. Uh, I write as me. I write a lot of nonfiction. I've got a business book for authors. Um, that we're for the month of April, it's been bumped down to 2.99, and we're trying to tweak the stuff because we were going wide with it. We're going to be bumping it down to 99 cents for the month uh, until everything calms down. Give everybody a chance. Um, get it. Hopefully, crank up the business writing side of the business. Yeah. Um, as the other me, uh, mostly this these days is James P. McDonald. I write science fiction, urban fantasy, bit of horror. Mm. Um, got some Southern Gothic coming out later this year. Uh, I've got, um, a fairy steampunk trilogy that's sort of in flight right now. Uh, and I've got a couple of novellas that are in flight so then I can get back to the book and then it's back to rewriting the, the new techno thriller series. Yeah. Okay. So let's see here. You've got sci-fi fantasy, uh, Southern Gothic, steampunk, and techno thriller. Mm -hmm. As well as privacy, yeah. as well as privacy, data security, artificial intelligence, oh, a lot of general ooh. business and stuff. Um, uh, I also own an author services and author education company. Um, wow. And we're part, and I work with a number of partners, most of whom um, either have worked for or do currently work for publishers okay. um, that because I, you know, it's all people I've most of whom I've known for years and years um, and most of whom have a long history in the business. Yeah. They've been doing a lot more freelancing because that's the way the business is going. So we've kind of pulled everybody together at um, author essentials is the name of the company. Um, mm -hmm. It's author essentials.net. And um, authoressentialsworkshops.com. And it started off just to be an author education company, the business mm -hmm. side of being an author. I'll, the whole story behind that was the number of friends of mine, I'd be at conventions or they pay me and go, hey, you're one of those weird business techie people, right? <laughs> and I go and say, yeah. Now, in, in business world, they go, you're one of those weird sort of creative people, right? Yeah. Right. So I yeah. yeah I kind of don't fit to either side, so I harass both. Um, <laughs> That's the way to go. So it started out as friends of mine would ask questions and it would be a, here's the answer da 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 and they cock their head and give me that look and smile and say that all sounds really nice and really important and I have no idea what the hell you just said. Oh. So then I started writing that up because I was doing a lot more articles and things in those days. Um, I've cut back just because of time. Mm -hmm. um, but I was, you know, it was like, all right, well, I'm writing this article up for this on this industry over here. Um, so let's go write this up here. And I'd write it up and we post it. And then it became a website called The Writer's Mind and some other friends of mine started contributing. And then the next thing was I was sitting at a convention. Somebody's like, so when you turn this into a book, I was like, well, funny you should mention that. Um, <laughs> and I met with a couple of agents. And I said, look, here's what I see as being the whole package. I said, no, no, we just want the book. Oh. Said, no, no, I, here's what I see as the whole package. We had some rights fights. And I said, you know, I'd rather just do this and do what I want to do. Yeah. So, you know, as is want to happen, I started another company. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know. Uh, it's the registering the company is the easy part. It's it's everything else that's the hard part. Who needs well, free time? Oh God, we haven't even gotten started yet. Um, okay. All right. But yeah, and I also do consulting work with companies and startups and a lot of that sort of stuff on both sides. Both people trying to get funding as well as you know helping people. And these days, most of what I deal with are people that are trying to do creative startups. Sure. Because that's a whole lot more fun than sitting there and arguing about whether or not your software is viable. Um, well, these days, I mean, the tech industry is exploding. So, yeah, I've been in it for a little while. 
and then of course I'm trying to work on as um, I was on with um, Gail Martin, and John Hartness. We're working on a little project. We'll probably talk about at some point. Mm-hmm. And he looked at me, and the first thing he said was, "I, you know, he says if you can keep letting the um, the quarantine beard grow, you can be Santa Claus by Christmas." <laughs> I mean, goals, you know? Yeah, it won't last that long. <laughs> I wouldn't know. Beards are kind of not really um, something I can do. So that's that's probably good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So how much do you do in a day? Because it sounds like everything is right on top of everything else. The answer would be yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I generally do run pretty hot. And mm-hmm. generally have a number of things running all at the same time. Um, the good news is for Author Essentials, I have a lot of people that I'm partnered with that handle, you know, that we do a lot of the stuff together. So these days I'm getting to do less and less of the having to do all of the work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've got, it, we've been sort of expanding. So I've got somebody that manages all the intake for incoming manuscripts or people needing artwork and things like that. Sure. And then I've got somebody that now is handling intake for me for nonfiction. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got somebody that's handling um, intake for me for fiction. And we're talking about standing up a um, academic line. Oh, as oh, well. Interesting. Um, so a lot of that. So I spend more of my time dealing with more of the tech issues. I'm training a couple of people right now. Um, one of the things I swore I'd never do again, which is run a web services company. We're running a web services company, um, doing <laughs> website development and stuff for mm-hmm. prime authors, artists, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, All of that stuff. Ooh, are you doing the UX yourself? Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Um, I've got somebody that is, I've, Got somebody who's doing helping doing some of the UX. One of the things that we're trying to do is get some templates built out mm-hmm. and basically build be the okay. Here's your your brand in a box, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's not yet the night name of it, but basically it's gonna be here you get these you can get these books, you can get these workshops. A lot of stuff we teach is free, a lot of stuff, you know, some of the other heavier content and stuff isn't. Um, gotta make revenues. Yeah. And, but one of the things that we also have and do is we're building new templates and WordPress and things like that so that authors can basically, if they have some tech savvy, pick mm-hmm. it up, do it themselves. Sure. Um, you know, plus the fact we're doing marketing work and whatnot. So we're, we're slowly expanding on my evil empire. Well, that's one way to call it. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm really so, curious because I just got out of academia last year. Um, for running an academic press, which it sounds like you're starting up, there's a lot of accreditation that goes into some of those pieces. It would not be an academic press. It uh, would be doing services for academics. Oh. And when I say doing the academic align, uh, I mean things like helping you with your query letters, helping you with your submission letters, helping review material and getting it ready. It's more those kinds of services. While we do have a press and a publishing house right now, it's all of our own internal right. material that we're putting out in publishing. Right. Um, later this year, we're targeting having I'm targeting having a marketing book out. Um, co-writing a tools book with somebody right now. A um, couple of other co-author project, projects that'll come out of our press. Mm-hmm. Um, and I work with some other small and medium-sized publishers. But our primary is straight up services. It is not, you know, we're not doing the, hi, we're a hybrid press scam. I'm telling you, um, no, no, we're you're going to be your publisher. Just write us a big check. No. Ah, yeah, okay. That makes but more from, sense. But um, from the academic side, the reason that we started working on that is, a, is several of the editors and, and artists that I work with are also you know, tenure professors, long term right. in academia, they do some of these services and they're like, hey, so like if you're doing all the rest of this, can we do this too? And I'm like, let's talk about it. Let's look at it. And we're we're evaluating doing it, but the answer is going to be we're going to do it because I'm talking about it. <laughs> Although the I quote, can edit this out if we need to. <laughs> no, uh-uh. 
Um, I occasionally know how to self-edit. Not often, but occasionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, okay. So moving from the nonfiction into the fiction world, I imagine it's a little bit different. Yeah. So I started writing fiction a long time ago. I had some short stories and stuff picked up. Um, I started trying to chase that career agenting and all of that a mm-hmm. very, very long time ago. Mm-hmm. And then I started traveling. I was, when I was in college. I actually started in media and nonfiction. Okay. And so I was writing fiction for, you know, for fun, for entertainment, for processing things out. Sure. And, um, ironically enough. And so just sort of kept working with it, playing with it. And I traveled for about 20 years, yeah. 48 weeks a year, Ooh. um, doing consulting work, which meant you get to see all sorts of things when you live in airports, hotels, yeah. sitting in the bar, you know, and I'm a museum hound. So there's plenty to see because you can only watch so much bad TV oh, yeah. um, oh, when yeah. you only get 12 channels sitting in a hotel yeah. if you have time to turn it on anyway. Right. And I started writing again. I started doing a lot of things as my way of processing things out. Mm-hmm. And so I was playing with doing a novel. I, I drafted a number of them and tossed them. Most everything I was doing was short novella length sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And when I went, we got married, well, a long time ago, um, seven, eight years ago, whatever it was at this point. So we got married. We basically had a two day honeymoon and then both of us had to be back to work dealing with what we were doing. Wow. Uh, and I was sitting on the, we were, we were up at the cabin where I'm at now. And I was sitting there and I was just sort of drafting out something that started as a short story. It was playing around with a boy and his dog sort Mm -hmm. of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And just mostly sitting there screwing around with it. And after playing with it for a while and playing with it for a while, and I sort of started drafting out. And a few months later, I had a full draft. And then the next thing I had was a seven book outline. Yeah. Okay, then. And I sold that to a small press that then folded. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, screw this, because I didn't expect anybody was going to see it, read it, anything else. It's like, hell, I'll throw it out there. And it started selling. Oh, wow. Uh, cool. And it's urban fantasy. Um, mm-hmm. The original title of it was, and here's the fun part. So the original launch date would have been either seven or eight years ago today. I forget which. Because I launched it on April Fool's Day because I was like, why not? A, I can remember what the date is. So it's just kind of a good irony here. Yeah. It launched on April Fool's Day. And a couple of weeks later, I had an event I was doing. Um, I'm a Scottish athletics, heavy athletics judge. Mm-hmm. Teach amateur athletics, do all, some of this other stuff. And we had an event here, or had an event in Charlotte. I'm unloading some stuff off the back of the truck. And I hear a friend of mine's voice behind me, gravelly, deep voice. And he comes and says, "Mm, you know, I know these two people get the date for forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And then they finally break down and get married. Then the next time I see him, he's published a book called bound and hagged. Is there something you're supposed to got to tell me about that? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's fantastic. And so the original titles, uh, the the first three are out, and the the first the the first collection is out. Mm-hmm. Um, and it started off as Bound and Hag. Um, oh God, now I can't remember the original titles. Uh, this is bad. But um, and went through. I had a cover artist that was doing really fun work. She would do charcoal sketches uh. and digital inking on the covers. Gorgeous covers. Um, she was also doing the ones for, for some of the novellas I had coming out at the time Mm -hmm. and covers were selling really well, really well. The next thing is they weren't. Uh And so we kind of played with, okay, I need to retool, do redo the covers. And we were sitting there and I was talking, we were talking with a couple of friends of ours. And it was like, if I'm doing this, may as well retitle as well as we're going through this. So they then got reissued as Pandora's Curse, 
Uh-huh. Um, can you tell it's early in the morning? Um, I'm 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 right there with you. Mm-hmm. Um, Pandora's Cursed, uh, and I just forgot the second the title of the second book of my own book, and the third one, Sorcerer's Choice. Um, mm-hmm. Then they're available as a collection called Home Summonings: The Winter Trilogy. Uh-huh. Um, I'm working on books four, five, and six right now. Because one of those joyous things when you outline a seven book series and you go, ooh, that's a cool idea that makes this much better. And you realize you just blew up the second trilogy. It takes a while to re-outline. Um, yeah. And so I've, I've rewritten book four now three times and tossed it three times. But the second three are going to be the summer trilogy because it goes they mythology and all this. The entire premise of the series is imagine if you would. Harry Dresden thrown on the world of American gods on a bad day. And it just gets worse. Yes. That's... So, you know, it's a lot of fame mythology. It's got, mm-hmm. you know, gods, monsters, angels, demons. I pull and you know, one of those joyous things when I was in college, I actually have a background in cultural anthropology. Oh, very fun. Um, which sometimes I wish I'd stay in, but oh, well, <laughs> so I pull a lot of that sort of stuff in myth, legend. What do we get to play with? What do we get to do? Um, and so it's a fun series to write. I've got a spinoff series from that called uh, the Longbow Initiative. Um, the third novella in that one should be coming out um, later this year. I've been saying that for a year because the business book sort of threw me off for about a year and a half because we kept hammering it that down and launching all the new services stuff we've been doing. Yeah. So I've been a little busy. So when you ask how do I get all of it done, sometimes stuff slips. Well, I mean, there's, you know, magic involved. And also um, the world is a little crazy. So <sighs> figure it out, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah it's getting there. Mm-hmm. Um, and my world is usually crazy anyway. But so, yeah, that's those two series. Um, I've got a number of different short story pieces out all over the place under a number of different names that I've written over the years because... I used to have to do a lot to keep the writing me separate from the professional me Mm -hmm. separate. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, you know, little things like when you're dealing with people's systems and strategy and everything else, and then you're writing about, you know, murder mysteries where somebody's killing gnomes and turning them into garden statues, they look at you a little funny. Oh, that's fantastic. I appreciate (laughs) both of those things. So it, it's one of those things that I have. It, that's kind of the twisted sense of humor. Everything I write is usually a little dark, a little twisted, mm-hmm. um, and a little bit of fun. So, you know, it, I try not to take any of that too seriously when mm-hmm. I'm playing with my fiction, n- no matter how many people I kill in the process. <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're not having fun, then there's not much point. Um. You should be having fun when you're drafting and telling the story. You should hate the book while you're editing and say, nobody will ever read this. It is the worst piece of shit that's ever seen the world. Oh, wow. Nobody, you know, I hate it. I hate myself. I hate everything. Why am I writing? Why am I doing this to myself? And then by the time you're over and done, you're like, okay, that's not bad. And then you start with the beta readers that tell you how bad you suck and what you need to fix. There you go. Oh, and by the way, first part. Yeah, if you want to be a writer, you have to learn not to really have feelings kind of early on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we'll just put all of the feelings into the characters, and then they end up having a bad day, and as you say, they kill gnomes, and it's uh, it spirals from there. Yep. <laughs> so that's that fiction is fun. It, yeah. It's got to be fun, even if you're telling. I mean. I've got friends that write Grimdark. Mm-hmm. There's two things I don't think I can write. Mm-hmm. One is Grimdark because the the smart ass in me would do something like if it was, you know, and walking through the deepest, darkest woods with the bodies hanging, dripping flesh. Da, 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 da. Somebody would look at something, you know, somebody would go, hey, Chuck, I hadn't seen you in a while. Good to see you're still hanging around. Hey, I can't do the Grimdark. I have read Grimdark that is sort of like that so it's not impossible to do it's not impossible but that's you know if, if you're not kind of bringing a little bit of fun and light just... the yeah. other thing for me is romance uh-huh. still have not been able to pull that off because um much like i, I was was doing a workshop uh, i've done i've said this many times so i was doing a re- workshop for the rwa 
And they're like, so you're going to do some romance? And I was like, well, at the end of the day, my sex scenes wind up looking a lot like the combat scenes. At least two people are going at each other. Somebody sticks something into somebody else. And by the time it's over, at least one person's flopping around on the floor covered in bodily fluids. <laughs> and a couple of them, people said, well, yeah, that's about it. I mean, sex scenes and, and combat scenes are a lot alike. I'm like, yeah, but the problem is the rest of that whole mushy lead in thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've never heard it described quite like that, but I appreciate that analogy a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty fantastic. I understand. No worries. I had a question, but that completely put it out of my head. <laughs> All right, I have won. I've scored. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, well done. Well done. Being involved on both sides of things, I imagine that the process of creating a book, either nonfiction or fiction, whichever you prefer, is a little bit different for you than the average person who focuses only on one probably um that big and i mean everyone's process is a little different mm -hmm. when when you're sitting there and if you're teaching panels or teaching workshops you're doing panels things like this and people go what's the what's the magic process that makes everything work um well you start with caffeine <laughs> Yeah, and a sick it. twist and a sick and twisted sense of humor and uh -huh. an idea and do some research and see where it goes. And that's pretty much true for both fiction and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If I'm writing an article, if I'm doing a talk about privacy, data security, yeah, you know, what's going on in the world today, these sorts of things. And mm -hmm. I can make an entire room of people paranoid the first three minutes and they got to stay there for another 50 with me. Um, and because it's one of those things I look at people and go, these things are just reality. Mm -hmm. It's not what's going on. It's not mm -hmm. how good or bad things are. It's how you react to them. Mm -hmm. It's how you integrate those things into your life. And it's how you deal with the things that are going on. Mm -hmm. And if you, everything you do is with some degree of intention and you have some planning in your life, then crises are a lot easier to do and to deal with. Right. Same thing is true because crises come big, little, you know, large, small. When you're doing fiction, we're creating crises. We're creating conflict. Yeah. yeah. That we then have to figure out how to get that person out of. You know, we just put them in the oubliette at the bottom of a volcano that's steaming up here. Every mm -hmm. portal is now sealed off. The air is getting thin. I've done it to them. I've got, oh, wait, I can't kill them off. I've got three more books planned. What the hell do I do now? Uh, let's see here. Magic, and, Rescue by Dragon, um, Come Back from the Dead. Yeah, kind of done all three of those. Um, <laughs> sometimes things just happen. Yeah. Um, you know, at one point in one book, I basically trapped everybody in hell and left them just sort of sitting there. And it was one of those, Oops. oh, huh, they're not dead yet. The yet is a useful thing. Um, actually, technically, it was not hell. It was actually Tartarus and the workshops of Tartarus where they used that to build reality. Okay. Um, but um, when we see conflict as creators and as authors, because we have to get creative those ways. Mm -hmm. If we can write somebody into a dramatic situation, we have the tool sets to look at real drama, real crises, real things going on and say, okay, how do I deal with this? Mm -hmm. You know, we write, I mean, pretty much every writer will tell you this. We write the weird shit because that's how we process things. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I know people who crank out high volumes, commercial writers, they're still processing their own thing. We show up in the books in a lot of ways. Same thing is true with nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right now I'm working on a piece that is about myth and mythology and how it shows up in non-traditional ways in film 
and all of these sorts of sorts of things. Oh, um, yeah, I've got to have that piece out the next couple of weeks. Um, hopefully it will, will make it into the final collection, but working on this piece, I'm playing with someone else's myth, legend, and story, someone else's interpretation of it. And then I'm going, you know, Hmm, let me do my best doctor, you know, at Mr. Burns interpretation. And how do I play with this and make sure that I'm going to offend everyone when I go and say, by the way, you can see all of this behind this. Um, <laughs> There's the cultural anthropologist. Yep. And so everybody has their own tools. Everybody has their own style. Everybody mm -hmm. has their own need and drive behind why they write. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's, and it's the same thing is true. If you're writing an article, even that's very dry about, here's the latest widget coming out about this. And you're writing about, here's the new shiny laptop that does X, Y, and Z, or, you know, things like that. You're writing product reviews. There's still, you can see the people that enjoy it, that find humor in it, that can can give things, that give it life versus yeah. the, I'm giving you the tech specs. It's going to run very fast if you're doing this, this, and this. You can overclock it to this, this, and this. And it's just hard facts. And yeah. you can tell the difference between the people that really are enjoying telling the story, even about something as boring as a product, mm -hmm. but they're carrying you through. Here's what's good. Here's what's bad. You can feel emotion and passion and things behind that. That's what makes a good copywriter. Mm -hmm. I've done some copywriting versus if you see the, and in today's news, we have the brand new da, 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 da. Yeah. There's it, it. It's the difference between the passionate and the dispassionate. And you can tell things that are hard and cold facts and still have passion to the words and the language and everything mm -hmm. you're doing. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, this is why, unless you're absolutely driven to write, go find another career. Because um, you have to be a little crazy. I think a little might be an understatement. Just starting just, point. Starting you're point. Gonna yes. go, you're you're going to go over the cliff before it's over and said and done. That's true. Very true. Yep. Yeah. All right. Now, I'm curious because uh, I came out of the linguistics world, so I've been looking at natural language processing and AI, and you mentioned you were doing a, some AI stuff earlier, and I'm just mm -hmm. curious where that fits into everything. So career-wise, I've done a lot of work around artificial intelligence and business intelligence. Um, most of my background is in banking, financial services, financial industries, yeah. Ah. Um, but I've also done some consulting on things like self-driving cars, how that sure. applied to the insurance industry. What do the logistics look like? The heuristics look like the really um, part of AI. Yeah. Uh, I've worked on some projects where we look at trying to beat the Turing tests. How do we make the AI responsive and adaptive? And, and so I've done some of those kinds of projects as well. Now, a lot of the time anymore, I'm just the old useless project manager or program manager looking at it and trying to herd the cats. Also means I get the... They're definitely cat-like. Mm-hmm. But I, that also means I get to be a bit in the weeds to see how it works. Mm -hmm. And having done some of this, I mean, I did some early, 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 early work on... AI business intelligence sort of stuff, you know, starting in the early 90s mm -hmm. where we were creating heuristics engines that were starting to have some of that ability to be self-learning within mm -hmm. a very specific data set. Sure. And within a specific industry. So when you look at how machines learn mm -hmm. and how we teach machines now, because we're starting to get to the point where we're teaching AIs the same way we would teach a child. Right. We're giving them sensory inputs. We're giving them language inputs. We're giving feedback, positive and negative, on how they respond. Mm -hmm. We're allowing them to do some self exploration. Mm -hmm. um, and I, for one, will welcome our you know Skynet overlords when they take over. Mm -hmm. um, the downside is that probably the only thing they're really going to be good at is selling us stuff. Um, oh. Oh, yeah, that would be unfortunate. 
And, and a lot of the time I've said this because mm, in a lot of ways, the first most likely sentient thing is going to be some is going to be a marketing program from Facebook. Um, that actually makes perfect sense. Glad it does somebody. But, you know, it, so when you look at things like this, these platforms, when you look at all the tools that are being developed, the technologies that are being developed, language is key. Mm. And if you look at experiments like the one that Google did, where they turned three AIs on each other and they began to develop their own language to talk to each other that we look at it and go, well, that's nonsense, but it's not to them. Exactly. And it's faster for them to communicate with that language in this way, even though they were still using language and words we recognize we didn't necessarily recognize the speech pattern. We didn't recognize the cadence. We didn't recognize, you know, the language, you know, the language structure that was mm -hmm. being used. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have to wonder sometimes if some of what slipped in there was, um, yeah, because they were using English. But you have to then wonder if you are dealing with somebody, for example, whose na na native language is Mandarin that mm -hmm. is trying to speak English. Well, the way you use articles and things like that is very different. Or if you're use, speaking to somebody using the romance languages, you're you're speaking to somebody who natively uses Hindi. The language language structure is very different. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of wonder if maybe some of those influences can be seen in how these AIs built their own language and their own structure. Mm -hmm. I've got nothing to prove it. Just an interesting thought. Oh, it's definitely an interesting thought. It's also possible that they've just accelerated the evolution of the English language and we won't see it for another 500 years in human production. Mm. We go back in cycles. I mean, again, we're talking with emojis now, which are nothing more than hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphs. Um, hieroglyphics yeah. adjective, sorry. I, I, sorry, I know. Uh, but, I mean, if you look at them as a glyph language, you look oh, yeah. at them as a symbolic language. You know, it's pictographic. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So if you're looking at it, we're, we've gone back to a pictographic language that has that we're using to give context. Right. In short conversations, texts, emails, chats, back and forth. Right. Um, if you, we're, we're seeing a move back into pictographic language, which, of course, is where the Arabic letters and, and numbers that we use now came from. Um, if you watch the study as to how the different letters came about from a pictographic language. And those are, oh, I love those. Those studies are great. So, I mean, it's a really interesting study to see where the things came from mm -hmm. to then get a better understanding of why they do what they do and why we use them the way we do. It's, it's an interesting thing to see. So even if we've created the technology, even if we have, um, even if it's our creation, it's still going to learn in its own way and it's going to find what's most efficient for it to do mm. things, to communicate. I mean, we see it in the animal kingdom all the time. You know, we think about insects. It's about crawling around. But if you look at how they can communicate with smells, visual cues, you know, think about a lightning bug that's, you know, there's all these different ways that we all communicate, most of which are not visible to us. Yeah. Which, of course, then makes the writer's job all that more difficult. Mm. Or at least more entertaining. Well, I think it also gives us the opportunity for inspiration. Mm-hmm. So let's say that I'm creating an alien species. You know, I, that gives me the ability, you know, we, we lean back on the common tropes of, oh, they telepathically communicated, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. We look at something like Doctor Who. We look at something like Farscape where there's the MacGuffin that gets used so that everybody speaks their own language, but everybody can interpret and understand each other because you got to fix the language barrier. Yeah, well, there's a couple problems with that one, but I won't get into that now. Oh, there's a ton of problems with it, but sometimes it's just IFM. You just right. have to use the IFM. Right. 
to make everything else work. Yeah. But then you look at something like the arrival with octopi people riding in the skies, appearing to be the aliens coming down. You know, that to me was a great representation of language and symbology mm -hmm. and trying to show how you can communicate and differences in communication style. And mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting to see. Yeah. It's definitely one of my favorite things to do. But uh, I understand not everyone is quite so keen on unusual language representations or conlangs or whatever. It's when you're a writer, when you're a creator, you're an artist, whatever, you have to find those things that interest you mm -hmm. and work those things in the story. Right. If you're going to be a writer, you better be interested in language. You better be interested in, in the entomology of it because you can discover things. If you're going to be writing steampunk, you'd better understand that cell phones weren't around in 1898. Ooh, yeah, not so much. Unless, of course, you need them to be, in which case you come up with things like the Farnsworth communicator. <laughs> That's what they yeah, call a the warehouse. I mean, we have to figure out what's the technology we need. And one of the hardest parts about being a writer these days, if you're writing in modern world, mm -hmm. there's the old joke about cell phones would blow up pretty much every plot line from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s. You know, yeah. If, that is... Buffy, if Buffy and the Scooby gang had cell phones. <laughs> so many problems would be solved. 90% of the episodes don't need to happen. Right. Yeah. Or at oh. least they'd be 10 minutes. Oops. <laughs> uh, yeah. Which is why we use things and use things now like, and it goes back a long ways. Magic and technology don't mix. Right. Although I have seen some, okay, I think the term is science fantasy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've seen some that do mix them fairly well, which is always interesting. One of the ones that I really enjoyed was from Babylon 5 and the Technomages. Oh, yeah. Definitely. They made, it, they made it look like magic. Mm -hmm. But pretty much they're like, they're just, they have arcane technology right um you know one of the things i have in the techno thriller series is even though most of it is technology and finance and trading and all this it's playing with old powers and old houses and all the rest of this they also have alchemists they may not necessarily be the most effective but there it's this part of the conflict is the transition from old guard Mm -hmm. and the ways they do things and a new generation coming up that's no longer patient to take their turn uh, and conflict okay. of old science in the form of alchemy and some of the rites and rituals and that was packed in and people that just want to mix the two chemicals and see the reaction uh -huh. and sometimes there's a difference in the result right oh interesting Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So, it, you know, when you go down these rabbit holes and you look at history and you try to figure out how do I apply these things, um, you know, because the entire premise behind the techno thriller series is um, the middle management to the Illuminati get laid off and some of them survive. And oh. <laughs> they've got kind of a harsh layoff package. Um, Imagine. But it, it's much more along the lines of you've got these houses running the world, doing all these different things. There's all these conflicts. There's financial stuff going on. There's playing games. There's politics. There's So it's this mix of the look of old court-style politics mm -hmm. and then walking into the halls of D.C. Mm -hmm. When you get to play with tropes like that and ideas like this and yet then can go and say, by the way, all those conspiracy theories you ever heard of, Here's how we're going to weave that weird little thing in here so somebody can go and say there's there's that crumb of crumb of truth in the fiction. Oh, I love conspiracy theories. 
I do too. And usually, uh, usually the fun in them is to tear them apart, but that's a different story too. Oh, I mean, you can still tear them apart. You just <coughs> might not do it in the way that people expect. Well, and that's where the fun is. Exactly. Um, so y- you've got to, it, creativity, you want to do, what do you want to express? Mm-hmm. And what's the gift you're going to give people, um, mm-hmm. out of your creativity. And so it's, it's a really a lot of fun. Um, and it's one of those things that for me is, is a lot of fun to do and helps keep my sanity such as it is. Yeah. Um, cause it's easier to kill people on paper than it is to get rid of the body. And well, most of the time, sometimes the editing process, it's easier just to kill a person off, but <laughs> hypothetically, hypothetically it's, Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, some of the research that I've had to do for various writing things, perhaps not the, um, most salubrious thing to be doing. Research is a beautiful thing to do. Just don't get stuck down the rabbit hole. Oh, that's a whole different set of problems. Um, that being said, we all get stuck down the rabbit hole of research. That's yeah. part of the fun of doing research, and that's where the fun stuff comes from. Yeah. If you yeah. come in and you're looking at research and the beauty of research and the beauty of language is sometimes proving you know and you understand it without becoming a lecturer to the reader. Mm-hmm. For the most part, you might have studied and broken down what the tatting pattern was in 1861 and 1865 due to the shortage of cotton thread and a shift in, in weaving patterns and things like that. But you don't need to explain that. You no. might just say that I miss my clothes from 1859 when the fabric was so much nicer or different weave or whatever. You know, sometimes like with technology Mm -hmm. now with technology, one of my, my most loathed terms is hackers and they got hacked. No, 90% of the time it was not the teenage kid sitting in the basement that, you know, it was played, wanted to play chess. Yeah, it's not passwords. Yeah, it's it's not the grand, you know, Russians running mega hardware farms running at you. It's because somebody called and said, are your windows running? Well, you better catch them. Can you give me your password and I'll help you with that? Yeah. Yeah. I really love it when they uh, ask about my Windows computer and I'm running a completely different OS. I'm like, oh, right. That one. Yeah, I've done the game of sitting there and they call it. Um, you know, this is, I'm so-and-so from Microsoft. Really? Do you know so-and-so? I mean, I know it's a big company, but they're over in da 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 Click. <laughs> but then if I'm in a mood to mess with people, it's, oh, you I'm like, which machine? Wait, which machine is it? Well, can you help me log? How do I do that? Is that this button? Okay, yeah, it's on. <laughs> I, I've been known to do that for up to about a half an hour before I get cussed out and they just go away. Yeah. Um, those are fun. Except for then you wind up on a call list because they want to harass you for doing it. And oh. you wind up blocking 20 numbers. Yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> I usually just answer the phone in uh, several different languages and see what happens. That one's fun. Um, yeah, back when my Gaelic was better. Um <laughs> You don't often get scam calls in Gaelic, I must admit. Um, well, yeah, it's one of those things of, oh, you're calling for who? Hang on a minute. Hi, yeah, uh, this is Windows. What? You asked for Windows. This is Windows. <laughs> and you just hear that pause of, are your Windows running? No, I'm sitting here right now. This is Windows. What do you need? <laughs> yes, I encourage messing with the tele, you know, with, yeah. Those are fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, many of the ones that I get these days are computer and they don't have nearly the same reaction. 
Mm, you can still mess with them, but it's a lot harder, and it's usually not worth the work. Yeah. That's when oh, you hit the zero button and let them come on the line. Oh, I've done that. I get hung up on more than I actually get a real person. Well, that's because they don't have anybody available in the robot island because the robot islers can. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's a whole different anyway. topic for a different day. <laughs> Uh, well, it has been super, super fun talking with you about all of the craziness in the nonfiction, fiction, um, multi-business writing world. Is there anything that we should be looking out for in the next short while? Um, so I do, like I say, I do have some pieces coming out later this year. Um, if you follow me at jamespnettles.com, um, you'll, you'll be able to get to the fiction me, the nonfiction me, author essentials me. Um, I've got, um, we've got new episodes of books and beer that are coming out. I'm in the process of editing right now with authors doing readings. Um, normally we do them at conventions. We do them sitting in the pub, have a few pints Sure. right now in the age of social distancing, you're going to have to do your pints at home, but you can still get some authors doing readings and support them that way. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> well done. And we've got new episodes. We're relaunching Creating Pros, which is more about the business side of being an author, mm -hmm. our creative. Um, I talk to authors, artists, musicians, uh, game development, all this sort of stuff. So a bunch of new episodes of that coming out. We just recorded. Um, we I did a two-hour session this weekend that will be four episodes um, talking about mindset and using games and things like that. That I'm actually trying to get all four episodes out this week. Very fun. Um, because, again, a lot of this is for both individuals and writers and creators and ways to keeping your sanity, as well as business owners or people now working from home and how you do all that sort of stuff when you're not used to it. Um, did an episode yesterday um, with uh, Joe Compton from Go Indie Now. Oh, yeah. um, so uh, talking about the film industry and movie rights and book rights and that sort of stuff. That was a good conversation. Um, got a couple more that are coming up. We'll be recording this week. And then last but not least, the project I talked about a little bit. Um, we have, it, it's, it's been in work for a while. Uh -huh. And because of the number of conventions being canceled, um, we're sort of accelerating the process. We have a project now called Con-Tenuous. Uh, so right now, if you go to Facebook and look for con dash tenuous, um, the ongoing convention, um, it's right now it's the Facebook group that's growing. We have a lot of video content that's coming. Um, we're planning to be doing both some live and pre-recorded content. Um, we're doing work right now with a couple of conventions that if they wind up canceling, we may wind up, um, doing live stream versions of, of the con convention. Oh, cool. So at least some of it comes off. Very uh, cool. So we're trying to create a lot of content right now for people while they're stuck at home, mm -hmm. but it's going to be an ongoing thing where we're going to be bringing in content um, from Paul staff books and their channel. Uh, it's going to be coming in from my shows. It's going to be coming in from some of Gail's content and shows mm -hmm. as well as some others. So Very. if you, if you're looking for content and looking for places to come and play and hang out, um, we fired it up about a week ago and it's growing very quickly. Everybody's right. welcome to come join. If you've got books, reading stories, art, if you're I anything at all, or even a lot of people have reached out and said, Hey, look, I can't usually do conventions because I'm in, I'm, you know, com compromised. I have these issues, this, that, and the other. So we're creating some of that online convention experience mm -hmm. and planning to have it going kind of on, a, on the continual basis. And, and so, so um, we'll have we'll be launching a website here soon. Um, we've in fact we're meeting on it again tonight to talk about the next round of content, what we're doing, mm -hmm. and then um, last but not least, I'm the the science and tech director for Con Carolinas here in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. um, so right now we're still a go. Uh, it's May 30th and 31st. Um, the next convention I've got that I'll be at will be. Um, back to back in July is pretty well packed, but if you're in the Southeast, um, we've got, uh, grandfather mountain Scottish games are coming up. Hopefully, mm -hmm. um, obviously everything right now is, is kind of up in the air. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got a convention in high point, North Carolina, um, congregate, which will be a fun event and convention to come to. 
we'll be doing Raleigh Supercon. Oh. The end of oh. July. And then I'll be at Dragon Con again. Um, you can find me on both the EFF track, Writer's track, Fantasy track, and probably wherever else I can cajole somebody to let me in while we're sitting at the bar. <laughs> Not a bad way to go. All righty. Well, thank you so much for doing this. It has been super fun. 